So, um, for these um, afternoon sessions, I don't want to fill you with more knowledge and more things to think about in your head. But nevertheless, it does give uh, a grounding and a basis for the things which I am teaching. And so, which is why that I've been uh, uh, translating some of these uh, basic texts for some time now. But, here we go. This is uh, the word of the Buddha uh, forward, so uh, in order to let you know what's going on. Okay, most people coming in. In 1907, that's over a hundred and, was it, eleven years ago now, the pioneering German-born monk, Werner Bunyana Tiloka, published the English version of The Word of the Buddha. It is described as an outline of the teachings of the Buddha in the words of the Pali Canon. And it consists of a selection of authentic teachings from the suttas that expound on the core Buddhist Dhamma of the Four Noble Truths, which include the Noble Eightfold Path. And for almost twenty years, I, that's me, had been using the Word of the Buddha as a textbook to introduce my monastic students to the Buddhist suttas. Indeed, in Bodhinyana Monastery, every Anagarika postulant and Samanera novice monk must complete this course in basic Buddhist teachings before they are allowed to receive the higher ordinations of bhikkhu. I have taken such steps to establish quality control in the Sangha under my training, so at the very least they are made aware of what the Buddha really taught from the most reliable source, the Sutta. Unfortunately, there is a problem. Although the Dharma is timeless, the usual presentation has become as if overgrown by impenetrable thickets of tradition. I have received countless well-intended criticisms that all the repetitions are discouraging. The similes are so archaic as to be obtuse, and some revered renderings of key Buddhist terms are rusted shut. The exegist is well past this use by day. And I quote here one of my favourite uh, Chinese proverbs, rather turn on the electric light than complain about darkness which is an ancient Chinese saying, updated. <laughs> you may have heard me say before, rather light a candle and complain about darkness. And how many of you in this retreat centre would light the candle? <laughs> this little book then, this is the word of the Buddha being done, is not another translation, 
it is a new type of translation. Not so much for detached scholars, but for those who immerse their whole lives in these teachings. I have followed I have followed Professor A. K. Warder's insightful advice. That is that he was a Cambridge professor who did a wonderful book, Introduction to Pali. And in that advice it says, it is the sentences which are the natural units of discourse and which are the minimum units having precise, fully articulated meaning. For purposes of study, we have to assign approximate meanings to words and this these vocabularies, but these generalised meanings of words are extremely vague, whereas, whereas sentences have exact meanings. In translation, one may, one may, in translations, uh oh, it's bad. Yeah, um, battery. I think it's battery. It is, it says it's out. So. Oh, great, tea break. Sue, <laughs> 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 can you ask about the battery? Do you know how to turn that one? Yeah, see the other things once before. Oh, the market's going. My oh, goodness. Where's the answer? This one's not working. The is on there. Do you know how to do it, Oh, this one's going too. <coughs> This one's gone. Very good. I'll just hold it. Oh, I'll put it down here. Okay. So, this translation, oh, that's right. Uh, in translation, one may find close equivalents for sentences, while it is often impossible to give close equivalents for words. Thus, in order to convey the meaning of the Pali, I have chosen to translate sentence for sentence and not word for word. A word has no permanent essence outside of a sentence. My authority to translate rests on my reputation as a well-known Buddhist meditation teacher, trained to think in Cambridge University and then trained to be silent for nine years under Ajahn Chah. An author of many books on meditation, teacher of Pali to many monks for 43 years, immersed in the life of a renunciant, open to scrutiny. I think I'm the only monk, or maybe the only person in Australia, whose bedroom is a tourist attraction, as people come visit my cave. For example, for many years I have consistently protested against a traditional translation of concentration for the party word samadhi, instead preferring stillness. This is not a trivial point for debate among philologists, the people who just study the meaning of words, for it cuts the very heart of the Buddhist path to freedom. Nor is my protest to serve an ego quite the opposite. The practice of concentration and the willpower on which it depends actually reinforces the ego. On the contrary, stillness and the letting go, renunciation on which it depends, brings the ego to cessation. And lastly, this is not the final version. Translations will always be work in progress. 
only hope that this version will elucidate, inspire and challenge. Students have remarked okay, on this one here. Students have remarked on listening to classes based on earlier drafts of this book, as if it is like listening to the teachings in the suitors for the first time. And their power is frightening, but at the same time compelling. As for improvements, I work on better sentence-by-sentence -sentence translations, but only when they arise from someone immersed in these teachings, living as a renunciant for the cessation of all ego, or any concept of a permanent essence within or beyond the five canvas. And lastly, Sabe Dhamma Nalang Abhinewe Sanaya. There is nothing worth keeping. So anyway, that was just an introduction which I wrote of why you will find these suttas uh, different. Now just, uh, it's based on, again, we mentioned earlier, of the uh, the Word of the Buddha by Venerable Nyantaloka. It's a very wonderful book. It became a classic, but I say 111 years ago now, it is a little bit dated. And sometimes the repetition and some of the translations do mean that they make a block for people really getting into this um, Dhamma. So I'm going to start uh, I'm not quite sure if you've had a look at this. You've all had access to it online. The start with, or oh, maybe I'll just pause a little bit, when I said that instead of translating samadhi as concentration, translate it as stillness. It's a far more accurate to the Pali translation. <coughs> Professor Rice Davids, uh, much merit to him, he was the first person who translated from the Pali into English. And it's to him that we sort of uh, show such gratitude. The word sati, he translated as mindfulness. There was a, a, a moment of inspirational genius that he used that word. And you cannot better it these days. But other things that he could have done better, but once they're, they're accepted that no one challenges them, and except rebels like me, and when it comes to samadhi, the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path, there was something very, very strange that he called it concentration. If samadhi meant concentration, then this indeed would be a concentration camp. A camp for development of samadhi. And many, many people have tried using concentration to develop deep states of peacefulness. Come on, concentrate! <laughs> and you will find that makes you very tense and you never get the benefits of meditation. But instead, you call it stillness. And stillness changes the ball game. How do you concentrate through effort and perseverance? And it does cause a lot of tension. Stillness, on the other hand, is only caused by letting go, by renouncing, by not grasping. As he mentioned and I showed in the first night, putting down a glass of water. That there you go. That is how stillness is experienced. And for so long, as a young monkey, when they're just struggling, putting forth effort and energy, every now and again you gave up, you just let go, like the Ananda method, and these incredible states of meditation came to you. But anyway, I'll tell more stories about that later on. So, changing a few words, this will not be what you've read before. I'm going to start off with just the basics, the Four Noble Truths. And then I'll see how much else we can do. I think because we've only got a few days, I think I'm going to focus mostly on the Satipatthana and the Panasati and Jhanas. 
But anyway, this was the, the Buddha uh, talking about the Four Noble Truths and enlightenment. It is through not fully understanding and penetrating the Four Noble Truths that I as well as you have experienced a cycle of rebirth and death for a very long time. There's no doubt that in the Buddha's teachings they always admit what to me is an obvious truth with much evidential support of not just one birth but the cycle of birth and death. Because of not fully understand, understand the noble truth of suffering, we have experienced a cycle of rebirth and death. By not fully understanding the noble truth of the origin of suffering, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, and the noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, that we have for a long time experienced the cycle of rebirth and death. And so long as my penetration and insight into these Four Noble Truths, as they really are, was not thoroughly complete in the three phases of twelve aspects, then I did not claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment of this world. First of all, well, I always pause and I say, how many of you know the Four Noble Truths? You all know them? Then why aren't you enlightened? <laughs> it's because we haven't fully understood them. It's something which we've missed, what I call the blind spot. And I know I should just not give my own commentary, but to say what I mean of blind spot, there was one of the friends I grew up with, those who used to maybe go to Chithurst in the early days, may have met an American-born man called uh, Ananda, Ajahn Ananda, who used to be a US Marine in Vietnam during the war there. And he got shot in the back of the head. And he thought he was going to die. But fortunately, or whatever, that the wound you know, had gone into the brain but they managed to uh, keep his life together. The doctor he was bandaged around his head and the doctor told him at the field hospital, you're a Marine, you're a tough guy, I'm going to just let you know that you're going to be blind. The area which is uh, the brain which has been removed will mean you'll never be able to see again. <coughs> I remember uh, Ajahn Ananda telling me he was only about one or two years junior to me, we were very good friends. And he said to me that at the time he was going to commit suicide if he could not see. Life was not worth living for him without his eyes. But when they took the bandages off, almost miraculous, his eyes were okay, he could see. And so he said he was high for a couple of years, just the joy, the relief of being able to see, being able to live. He was put on a pension from the US Army of $1,000 a month, which in those days was a lot, a lot these days as well, without needing to do any work at all. And he said that one day he was uh, playing baseball with his friends, and the batter hit the ball high in the air in his direction. It was a simple catch. And as you do if you're following a ball about to catch it, you follow with your eyes, and that is when the ball vanished. It disappeared out of existence. And then, a couple of seconds later, it reappeared. Only then could he infer he had a blind spot in his vision. An area in his field of sight which his brain had filled in with what it expected to be there. And it was only when a ball was travelling in the air did his brain make a mistake and admit, uh, omitted, omitted the ball from his field of vision. It was a blind spot. And he never realised it was there until his brain made that mistake. The ball vanished. Now that is a simile which I've used 
for the fact that we may know the Four Noble Truths. But do we really understand that? If you did, then you would know sometimes why your meditation is suffering. There are two types of meditation. Who knows what the two types of meditation are? Any suggestions? Thank you for making the mistake. <laughs> Those of you who listen to me before, if I ask you a question, keep quiet, they always treat questions. <laughs> I do apologise and I led you down the garden path, as they say here. Now the two types of meditation are Second Noble Truth Meditation and Third Noble Truth Meditation. What's the Second Noble Truth we find out in a few moments is wanting, desire, craving leads to suffering. It's going to come up in a moment. If you want something, the Buddha said it's a cause of suffering. So during this retreat, if your meditation is not satisfactory, if it's disappointing, if you're not getting what you want, if it's a real pain, frustrating, all over the place, if it's suffering, that means you've done the second noble truth. Wanting, having goals, is a cause of suffering. Third noble truth meditation, Letting go of wanting is a cause for nirvana, the ultimate happiness. So if you have a good meditation, what you call a good meditation, peaceful, happy, you can sit here with a nice smile on your face, time having no meaning, loss of joy, you've just done third noble truth meditation. Check it out. And anyway, the when the, the Buddha's penetration insight was thoroughly complete, then he claimed to be fully enlightened. He understood the noble truth of suffering, not just as a theory, is to be fully understood, not just partially understood, fully understood, and realizing he'd understood it. The origin of suffering, the wanting, which causes rebirth, Wanting the origin of suffering is to be abandoned, to be given up. And when he understood that wanting has been abandoned, no more wanting anymore. Sometimes the translation which you normally recognize is craving. But that craving is an intense form of wanting. And it doesn't recognize the ordinary types of wanting, even for good things in this world. There's also the cause for stress, for suffering, for lack of peace. The third noble truth of the cessation of suffering, extinguishing that wanting, and realizing the end of wanting is to be realized, not to be studied, or to be expounded on, be actually to be realised in your life. And understanding the end of wanting has been realised. And lastly, the noble truth of the way leading to cessation of suffering. How do you let go of suffering? It's a noble way for path. Sometimes people ask, well how can you let go of wanting? When you want to let go of wanting, that's more wanting. And trying to let go of craving, that's doing more craving. So, I'm not going to do anything anymore. I'm not going to do. You don't let go of doing. You don't do letting go. Both are just more types of doing. There's a very subtle path, the way, which is a noble eightfold path. The way to the cessation of suffering. And the Buddha realizing the noble eightfold path had been developed. In regard to things unheard before in this generation, in this generation, but previous generations, Buddha Gautama was not the first Buddha, no Buddhas before. 
and deep in the Gatikara Sutta, the Buddha remembered her previous life as Jyotipama, a disciple of Kasapa the Buddha. He heard this before, but in a previous generation. So there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. I consider this Dharma that has been awakened for is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime. If it's real, insight is peaceful, unattainable by mere reasoning. Not that you have to give up your reasoning. Reasoning will get you so far, and then you have to go for some direct experience. Subtle to be experienced by the wise. But this generation delights in attachment to itself, takes delight in attachment to itself, rejoices in attachment to itself. It is hard for such a generation to see this truth, namely the empty process of cause and effect, dependent cessation and origination. Often people mention dependent origination, but dependent origination always comes with dependent cessation. So I put it the other way around, dependent cessation and origination. Just like people always say monks and nuns, why don't we say nuns and monks? Furthermore, it is hard to embrace this truth namely the disappearance of the will. Here, using the rendering of will, or sankara, which is blooming accurate, but challenging. Sometimes that I started, for this is a bit tough to teach this, people were arguing with me, but it was my student, Ajahn Brahmari, who really sort of it means will, Sankara, and the things which come from that will. So when you state this, the Sabha Sankara Samatha, this is the stilling and disappearance of the will. That is challenging. The relinquishing of everything that has been acquired everything that has been acquired. No possessions left, not just physical, not just your body, but your mind as well. Literally losing your mind. That is supposed to be craziness, but this is what happens in our meditation. It's not crazy at all, it's bliss. Destruction of wanting, everything fading away, cessation, nibbana. There are beings with little dust in their eyes that are wasting for not hearing the stoma. There will be those who will understand the stoma. That was just a classic introduction. And I hope it challenges you. Otherwise, what's the point of mm -hmm. listening to what you already know? Anyway, that's giving you a little taste of freedom, maybe. Now I'm going to go on to just uh, something a bit more practical, which is meditation. Mm -hmm. Oh, are we going to do the... Oh, yeah. Um, Edward Chandler was suggesting that also, again, to give you... Actually, first of all, are there any questions on this so far? Because during this class, you know, you are allowed to speak. <laughs> Actually, so that we can. So if anything which is challenging, please ask. My goodness. I'm all in anyway, also, the, one of the most wonderful parts of the Eightfold Path is something which challenged me for a long time. Where is compassion and kindness in the Eightfold Path? Now I knew 
the Buddhas are famous for its kindness and compassion. You go to the great teachers, you know, like an Ajahn Chah, and they were just so kind and compassionate. But where was that? In the Eightfold Path. There was right stillness, right effort, just right view. Where was the right compassion and kindness? And of course, you find it in the second factor of the Eightfold Path, which is called Samasankapa. Usually people call it right thought. Oh my goodness, this thought is a problem. Sometimes people call it the right intention. More goals, more things to aim for. So anyway, looking at its definition, a much more accurate description of the second factor of the Eightfold Path is right motivation, where you are coming from. And to make it quite clear, as I get the page, here we go. Right motivation. What now is right motivation? Actions of body, speech and mind arising from a motive of renunciation, from a motive of kindness, from a motive of gentleness. Nekama, which is renunciation, otherwise known as letting go. From kindness, usually awayapada, the negative, non-ill will, which is a synonym throughout the suttas for kindness, for metta. And lastly, ahimsaka, which is, everyone knows these days, thanks to Mahatma Gandhi, means non-violence, gentleness. I'm so happy to see in the Pali the gentleness, which is part of our training, and also the kindness and the letting go. That's right there in right motivation. And just to see the Eightfold Path as a whole, from the right view, which is a good translation, from the right view you get the right motivation, where you're coming from. And where you're coming from, that influences your acts of body, speech, and livelihood, the virtue part of the Eightfold Path. If you're coming from letting go you're not trying to obtain things and steal things and get things. If you're coming from kindness, you never harm or hurt. If you're coming from gentleness, which also includes the patience as well. From those three motivations, you'll find your virtue becomes natural. Speech, actions, livelihood, all based on the right motivations. And then from there, the next part of the Eightfold Path is the right, I still haven't got a good translation for this, effort doesn't cut it with me. It is the effort which causes a lot of harm. Get out of the way, I am meditating. Stop interfering. I'm on the way to the bar. So sometimes the, sometimes the effort, instead of effort, you will find the four right um, endeavors are always about renunciation, letting go. And from the renunciation, letting go, that purpose of that is to allow the, um, the five hindrances to be weakened. When the five hindrances are weakened, then we are prepared for the next step, which is the Satipatthana, which is where I'm now going to properly begin. Right mindfulness. What now is right mindfulness? 
The four focuses of mindfulness, instead of calling it the foundations of mindfulness, I always prefer the four focuses because the foundations are the earlier part of the eight form path, one, two, three, four, five, six. The foundations, the preparations, and the view, the motivation, the virtue which follows from that, letting go, leads and kindness and gentleness, always leads to um, a natural goodness, a natural uh, restraint. And that is uh, strengthened by the endeavours, otherwise known as sense restraint. And that weakens the five hindrances. So what now is right of mindfulness? The four focus of mindfulness leading one direction only, to the purification of beings, to going beyond sadness and crime, to the disappearance of physical and mental suffering, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana, what are the four? First of all, the leading one direction only, that's the Aik Ayana, and sometimes I just wonder about why it is that people still translate it as the only way. You know, any sort of Pali scholar, even just beginning, knows it cannot mean that. The only way is Eka Yana. This is Eka Ayana. It's a different word. Okay, this is being pedantic, but there's no other explanation. And to reinforce that, in the commentaries to the two Satipatthana Suttas, the one in the Majjhima Nikaya and the one the Maha Satipatthana in the Diga Nikaya. Both of those commentaries say in particular it doesn't mean the only way. So sometimes whenever you are... Okay, another little story to reinforce this that uh, a few days ago, I was then in Oxford, the talk I gave there, and one of the gentlemen who was listening to my talk was a student of Bernard Carr, who was one of the, who was the first Buddhist I ever met, and we shared so many interests together. He became a close disciple of Stephen Hawkins. That's one of the reasons we, we were both theoretical physicists both Buddhists, and both interested in psychic phenomena. So as well as being Emeritus Professor of Theoretical Physics in Queen Mary College at London University, also Bernard is currently the Treasurer of the London Psychic Research Society. Goes around looking for ghosts and other weird stuff. It fits in. If you ever study quantum physics, you understand that they're all weird things. And this is where we try and find more data for the weirdness of life. And he told me of this amazing experiment which was done at Imperial College London on levitation. A very renowned physicist claimed to his associates that he was going to demonstrate levitation in the laboratory situation in front of his peers, research scientists, professors, and he invited them all into this lecture theatre. And he brought in a flower pot and placed it on the bench. Those of you who have you know, studied any science could know in the lecture theatre they usually have a big bench and you put your apparatus or whatever it is on there. He just, just an ordinary flower pot on top of the bench and all the professors just in their seats as it rose to the back looking on, making sure there was no wires or anything there, trying to, to hook onto this flower pot to make it raise. They had infrared cameras, other cameras, um, to record if it actually happened. 
a flower pot levitating in front of professors. Trained, objective observers. And then, having made the introductions, he said he needed to create the correct atmosphere to assist the levitation of the flower pot. And he requested all of these crusty old professors to start chanting Om. And I always mention that was an amazing achievement to actually to get all these card scientists in the 50s and 60s to start going Om, Om, Om. And as they were chanting Om, the flower pot rose into the air. It was recorded, filmed, levitated, it levitated. It actually worked. And at the end of the demonstration of levitation, he asked the professors, lecturers, research scientists what they thought of the levitating flower pot. And several of them said, what are you talking about? That flower pot stayed on the table throughout the experiment. It didn't rise above the table at all. I showed them the recordings, that was just fate. I was there, I saw it, it never levitated at all. And there we get to the point of the experiment, because the truth was that underneath that bench was a huge, extremely powerful electromagnet it was just done according to science, it didn't really levitate for any supernatural reason, but that wasn't the point of the experiment. The point of the experiment was, when it rose into the air, it was something which was so against what was possible, that perception denied its very existence. It did rise, because of the the uh, electric current, simple electromagnetic limitation. But the point of the experiment was they didn't even become aware of it. They didn't see it. It was blocked out. Of course, they needed to chant Om, because anybody knows if you turn on a very powerful electric current, everyone can hear it humming. <laughs> and the arm was just to mask that. <laughs> that was the only reason for the arm. Very brilliant. So that is one of the reasons why that sometimes the truth doesn't even appear to our conscious awareness. Perception is blocked without you even noticing it. So that's one of the reasons why really good monks they're taught brainwash the only way and you think they know better but training anyway what are the four foundations or four focuses of mindfulness having restrained the five hindrances you abide aware of the body energized knowing the purpose of what you are doing and mindful. The same with the other three focuses, having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of experience, Vedana, of mind, the chitta, and mind objects, energized, knowing the purpose of what you are doing, and mindful. The Pali is loke abhija, so vinaya, loke, loke abhija dhammanasa. And again, good old without so demeaning this great. Um, efforts and wonderful achievement that um, Professor Rice Davids translated that as having restrained grief and covetousness for the world. You may recognize that if you've read the usual translation of Satipatthana. And it never made any sense to me at all. Rest having, restra how was it? having restrained uh, grief and covetousness for the world? Well, what's that all about? And following Professor Rice Davis' advice, 
I did my reading of the sutras in Pali first. I read them in the original and there. It came across so many times. Loke Abhija instead of Karma Chanda. Karma Chanda is the standard first hindrance. Loke Abhija is a synonym, an alternative. And I think in the Aguta Nikaya we choose the most. About 70% of the time in the Aguta, they use the word Loke Abhija. 30% Karma Chanda. It's a, a synonym. So the word says Loke Abhija in the Satipatthana, it refers to the first hindrance. Where it says uh, grief for the world, grief for the world, it's not really grief for the world, it's covetous for the world of grief. The grief is just um, Dhammanasa. And that is used in two suttas as a synonym for the second hindrance. And you look in the, um, the commentaries, and there it says clearly that the word Vinaya Loke Abhija Dhammanasa refers to having restrained the first two of the five hindrances. Yes. And that actually is why people practice the Satipatthana for several days and they don't get anywhere. As I mentioned this morning with the simile of the old man and the farmer, an old monk stone by. Those people weren't following the instructions. People passing Satipatthana don't follow the instructions. They don't understand the five hindrances first. I said the two in, in Pali means the whole five which is the idiom. So when I write here, having restrained the five hindrances, you abide, aware of the body, experience, mind, and mind objects. That is accurate to the suttas. And it's obvious, once you see it, the, how can you be mindful when the five hindrances are really, really strong and active. You just see what you want to see. And you deny what's right in front of your nose. Just like the simile of the final point. So, the job of the first six factors is basically to restrain the five hindrances. And once those hindrances are restrained, you're peaceful. And one is strong and courageous, then you have a chance of seeing what the body experience, the mind and the mind objects truly are. You may also notice that I did alter the usual translation of Vedana, which many people say feeling. And they justify that by saying, well, it's you know, the pleasant, unpleasant, or in between. That is just three obvious types of experience. What Vedana means, and this is just from the, the Pali word, it means experience, war experience. What you're doing now, experiencing this moment. <coughs> the fact it can be pleasant, unpleasant, or in between, it just you know, and the same with the garden, what's a garden, you know, a garden by its contents. You know, it's, it's plants, it's vegetation, it's features, like a garden or a path, like a water feature, a path, a fountain. But you use those things to describe garden. So experience is usually, it has to be either pleasant or pleasant or in between, but that's deciding what experience is the focus of your attention to small experience. That also troubled me, in between experience. It's very hard to see something in between, right in the middle. As a part of a scientist being a mathematician, to share a cake, to cut it in half, there's no such thing as half. 
there's always 50.000001 and 49.9999. You can never get to that actual one and a half. So anyway, I'm almost out of time. I'm going to the first part of my mindfulness. Anyway, mindfulness of the body. How are you aware of this body? Do you know your body? Who does it belong to? What is it? And sometimes going to see autopsies as a monk. That was really cool. Especially as a monk in, I don't know so much about Sri Lanka, but in Thailand. Monks were allowed to walk in to the autopsy rooms and just have a look. They even stand beside the pathologists as they cut up the bodies. And my first experience of the autopsy rooms in Siri Rad Hospital in Bangkok was really weird. I arrived early and in the big lecture theatre they had the slab on which they would put the dead bodies. And again, just the seats which rose up to the, the back where there was windows, high windows to give light. And I could not believe what I saw. Instead of where you would usually expect a flower pot next to the window on the shelf, there was a human head on a plate. And I thought this was like something out of some horror movie. It must be a fake. So I walked up, picked it up, it was real. It was a real human head. Weird stuff. It was there. Anyway, I think they just cut somebody's head off, didn't know where to put it, so it's sort of like a good place, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes people get grossed out, but it's just a head, that's all. Yeah. <coughs> if anyone wants to get a head in life, you know the place to go. <laughs> Everyone's lost their head, maybe in two our hospital at the time. Anyway, to actually get to know the body. And you, first of all, the first method of Masati Patara is mindfulness of breathing. You go to a quiet, secluded place. Dulcie Bridge, good example. Keep it quiet, don't destroy the peace. Somebody asked me, can you please say a nice saying to them? Uh, it was, what was that? It was just a recent retreat. Okay. If you can't improve upon the silence, be quiet. Beautiful saying. If you can't improve, actually to my monks, just before I left, I was always making too much noise. So I told them, if you can't improve upon the silence, monks, keep quiet. It's very hard to improve upon the silence. So most of the time you're quiet. You go to a quiet, secluded place, sit down comfortably and give priority to establishing mindfulness. Not put mindfulness in front of you. What the heck does that mean, mindfulness in front of you, when there's no one there? Where, where actually are you? Where do you live? in your body. I'm going to do a little party trick now for you. I want you to put your hand up, your right hand or your left hand. And you can't, please, you know, don't keep your hands down. Don't put both hands up, one or the other. Don't wait for it, be patient. <laughs> and if you are more um, content than disappointed, well, let's call it happy. If you're more happy than sort of disappointed, I want you to put your right hand up. If you're more disappointed than happy, put your left hand up. So, okay, right hand if you're more happy than disappointed. Left hand if you're more disappointed. Keep it right up, come on. Right up. Now, with your index finger of the hand you're holding, please point to the happiness for me. <laughs> point to it. Locate it, where is it? Point to it, please come on, where is it? 
Where, where, where's your happiness? Come on, where do you point to it? Is it here? Is it in your nose? Is it in your tummy? Is it in your physical? Why can't you locate it for me? Did you just imagine the happiness? Where does it live? Or are you just imagining this? You cannot point to happiness. You cannot point even to anger inside your body because it doesn't live there. And this happiness, anger, peace, contentment, love, compassion, freedom, these are things which live in your mind. Just like the flowers and trees define a garden. These things define the thing we call mind. So when you say, establish mindfulness in front of you, what does the hell that mean? That's why so many people think they live here, in their, their head. So you establish mindfulness here. Not down here, you don't live in your nose. Is that where you live? Maybe in the evening, when you haven't eaten, you live down here and you do the belly meditation. But it doesn't mean that. And too many people, they do meditation on the breath, focusing here. And that was the first time when I heard of samadhi headache, meditation headache. And I heard that in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. And I've never heard that before. I, when I meditate, headaches go. Pain disappears, sicknesses are relieved. Meditation headache, what is that? And then they told me that there they concentrate on the tip of their nose, watching the breath on the tip of their nose. So I did an experiment to try and find out why does this cause a headache? Because I don't do that. If I watch the breath, I just watch the breath. I don't watch the nose. So I took my glasses off and I watched the breath at the tip of my nose with my eyes open. <laughs> and you will find that if you focus and concentrate, especially on the tip of your nose, even though you only think you're doing this with your mind, your eyes follow. And so you're holding your eyes in a really uncomfortable position on the tip of your nose. No wonder you get a headache up here. It's tension which always is associated with concentration. So what we do, we don't focus on the tip of the nose. It doesn't mean establish mindfulness in front of you. It's the old word, establishing it as a priority, first on the list, number one, the top thing to do. It's a metaphor, making it first, priority. The word priority is great because you give someone priority. The priority boarding lane on the aircraft, which means you get on there first. Give the most priority for the, uh, the food. Don't worry, we need plenty for you. <laughs> and that means putting it number one. So what this means is giving mindfulness a priority. First, now you'll understand why I usually spend the first couple of days teaching a retreat, not even mentioning the breath, not even mentioning focusing to get mindfulness strong. Establishing that first. Present moment awareness. Relaxing. Bringing some happiness into the moment. So you're not needing to, to go and fantasize about sex or have romance uh, dreams or worries. It's amazing just how many people go off into fantasy world and think and worry simply because they're not happy being here. 
They want to just fill the gap of suffering. There's some fantasy, if it's in fantasy land, you're always a winner. You're always a person who kicks the goal for your football team and wins the FA Cup. You are always the best lover in the country. You're always the hero in your fantasy land. That's why it's much more attractive than real life. But that is not the purpose of meditating. So we have mindfulness. In this moment, with some kindness, and you find being here is actually quite beautiful. It's much better than being somewhere else in fantasy land. Being peaceful. So first of all, we make an, a very big preparation on being here, mindful. And also, oops, <laughs> this first set of pajamas will take a long time. <laughs> but also, the other thing is, when you're thinking, you're not aware. Explain why. Lao Tzu, one of the great masters in China, every evening he would go on a walk with his disciples, with one. But they had to keep noble silence. They weren't allowed to speak at all. On this one occasion, the Master Lao Tzu took one of his new disciples, explained in the temple and monastery the rules, and they went on a walk together. When they came to a ridge in the mountains, it was evening time, it was an incredible, beautiful sunset. And it was so gorgeous, the student forgot the rules. I said, wow, look at that beautiful sunset, that's amazing. He broke the rule. And so Lao Tzu turned around, walked back to the temple, and when he got back, announced to everyone else, that student will never be allowed to go on a wall with me ever again, for the rest of his life. And when the other students said, that's a bit severe, couldn't be a little compassionate to him and give him another chance? And why? Anyway, what's wrong with, with saying what a beautiful sunset? And this was the reason I love this story. Because Lao Tzu's answers just encapsulate why when you are thinking you're not mindful. He said, when my student said, what a beautiful sunset, he was not watching the sunset anymore. He was watching the thoughts. <coughs> There's a difference between being mindful of the thought and being mindful of what that thought is trying to capture. You don't need to have the thought. It's actually one step away from reality. Thoughts create arguments. Peace creates harmony. You don't need the thoughts. One last little addition to this. In our Bikudu monastery in Perth, very hard to get there these days, I'm so busy being in another country. And so they asked for me, for me to give them a quick teaching. I know I feel sometimes bad, I don't teach them enough. But anyway, I gave them a very quick teaching. I was about to get in the car to go to another appointment. The reason I go in cars a lot is because I'm trying to reduce my carbon footprint. I, I say, but if I'm not walking, I'm leaving no footprint. <laughs> <laughs> That's only a joke, don't <laughs> criticize me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I asked them, so where's, where's the, the toilet? I need to go and uh, leave myself before I get in the car. And they looked at me a bit strange, because I built that place, I know where that toilet is. But they said, oh, just over there, you can see it says toilet on it. Now, male toilet. I oh, thank you so much. So I walked up there, 
and I pretended to urinate on the door. And then I said, what the heck are you doing? I jumped around, have you lost it? Well, it must have been a long time ago, but... <laughs> and I said, well, well, you told me that's the toilet, and that he says on there, my old toilet. So that's where I'm urinating. He said, no, 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 that's just the signpost. The toilet's actually inside. He said, yes. The words are not the thing. Just no more than the toilet door with the sign on is where you're supposed to do your urination. Making a point like that was something they wouldn't forget. <laughs> But we sometimes say, Sati Patana, what's Sati Patana? And you read a book like this. That's a signpost. Where is that pointing to? All the thinking, the words, that is what people stop at. One last thing. What's this? What is this? Please you can speak, otherwise this example doesn't work. <laughs> what is it? Glass of water. What else is it? What else? What else? What else can you tell me about this? What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? That two and a half, two and a half years ago, I was invited to give the keynote address at the 2015 World Computer Conference in Korea. Really cool. I don't know anything about computers. <laughs> I was giving the keynote address in front of all. <laughs> it was weird in front of all these these big shots from from Samsung and LG and Google and stuff. And there I was, this, and they, they asked me, what the hell are you doing here? You know, what do you know about computers? And I said, oh, be quiet for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? I asked them. I did it with a plastic water bottle. I said, what else is there? What else? What else? What you just told me is the names, the words, the description, the thoughts. When you've exhausted all the thoughts, then maybe, you can see something new in this. The labels, the thoughts, the descriptions are what stop you seeing further. You can't innovate. When all you see is a glass, water, cylinder. This is what I mean by thinking. Labels. They stop you going deeper. There comes a time, so mindful, you don't even think. That's when you start to see. That's when you start to become mindful. That is one of the first steps of Sadhguru To be mindful, not thinking, as is Conte. Not just in the past or future. Purely open. To the present moment, see what comes. So, I do apologise, that was much more the word of Ajahn Brahm than the word of the Buddha. <laughs> I'll try and be a bit more focused next time. But anyway, any complaints or questions, there's a box out there, and we can do the questions in the box in another couple of hours' time. Now's the time. Sorry? Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Oh, that's three hours. Well. Anyway, right now, three sides. Sadhu. 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 Okay. So anyway, there we go. So have a nice meditation if you want to go have a cup of tea. Or I'll just have a bit of exercise and meditate. Please, off you go. Make a second for meditation. 
7 for meditation to 8. It's not compulsory. You can, you can always just, same as that tea time, it's not compulsory. You can always just <laughs> carry on sitting here until tomorrow morning. Nothing makes myself free. Now just look after your body. Remember the kindness and gentleness to your body. <laughs>